Hello, it's Kyle Wilson, founder of Jim Rohn International, your success story on kylewilson.com. And today I have my friend, Phil Collin, who's just one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. Phil is the lead guitar player for the band Def Leppard. They've sold over 100 million albums. You know who they are. He's also part of two other bands, and we're going to go down that road today. But I always say Phil is world-class in three areas. I've spent a lot of time with him. He's a world-class musician. He's world-class in fitness, as you're going to find out. He's also world-class in personal development. I first met him in 2013. I got to film at his house on a project. Uh, he since has been to my house and did a, a mastermind with my inner circle. We've been backstage multiple times in Dallas and LA. And again, just one of the nicest human beings. You're going to learn a ton today. So I'd like to welcome Phil Collin. Thank you, Carl. Lovely introduction. Thank you. Hey, I like the beard. But me too. I was, I was, I, it's just the laziness. It's the COVID thing and everyone is like, oh, it's really great. And it's, it's great not having to die the sideburns, just let it go. And it's like, very cool. And you're, uh, you're in Southern California at your home. I am, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the lifestyle you've created for yourself because you've been there over 20 years in the neighborhood. 30, actually. It's 30. About 30. Yeah. Uh, a family. I've been there a few times. I got to see your guitar collection, which we'll talk about later, which is incredible. But uh, Phil, hey, I got so much on the list I want to talk about today. Yeah, absolutely. In including COVID and all of that. Yeah. But hey, I do want to jump in and, and kind of go our, you know, go down the music road. But sure. you grew up in England, uh, in a suburb of London, I believe, right? And yeah, East London. I, I was born in Hackney, which is East London, and, and grew up in a place called Walthamstow. So yeah. Is that uh, famous for any other like actors or musicians or people we would know? I think Idris Elba was born in the same hospital as me, actually. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think so. But we, we'll find out. I know he was born in Hackney. So, yeah, we'll find out whether that's the, the same one or not. But, yeah. And, and relatively speaking, you started playing the guitar a little bit later in life. Very late. Um, I was 16. You know, I, I, with a lot of things in life, you know, you, you think that it's something out of touch. You don't, don't think you'd achieve that. And I think I, uh, as a, a young kid, you know, loved music, was such a fan but thought that was completely out of reach until I finally got a guitar. And then I, I realized it was like, whoa, it's not really about that. And it was definitely within reach. And within a year I was, I was playing, playing away. So you never know until you try. So it's the same as everything else, you know, recording studios, you know, you'd walk in there and go, oh my God, it's like, it, it's, it's scary. It's like intimidating and stuff. But now I record everything on my laptop and, and you, it, it's kind of eliminated a lot of that. So you can directly go artist, to record in like immediately and, and not have kind of middleman in, in the thing. So I've, I've, you learn that and you, you, you know, apply that to many other things in life. So uh, that's fantastic. And, and so, yeah, it was very late for me, but you know, I just had to make up for it. It was all in the head. It was just, it just had to get out there. You know? Yeah. Well, I always say we learn by doing right. Yeah, I became a seminar promoter. I didn't know how to do that. Then I became an agent didn't know how to do that and created right. products. And I know you've, produced many record albums, of course, having a great mentor in Mutt Lang. Yeah. But going back to those early years, you got in a band called Girl. And if, in fact, you left high school. You, right. you left high school early, got a job, and were recording on the side. And this band well, actually had a little bit of success, right? It, it did. I was, I was working, I left school, wor worked in a, in a factory, actually, in a burglar alarm factory. And, um, and then as a dispatch rider on a motorcycle and, and stuff. Uh, and then our band got, got a record deal and it was, we were only getting about 50 bucks a week, but that was all of a sudden I'm a professional musician and, and, and I could concentrate on that. And there's, there's something very rewarding with that artistic expression. I think that's, it's more that, you know, I speak to a lot of people and they go, well, I got in a band because of the girls and da da da, and it, and it wasn't that. I, I I had something that I had to get out, and, and that was the the artistic expression. So even if you're the worst musician in the world, but you've got something, it's like an itch that, that you get to scratch, and and I think that that's what I experienced that part of that, and that was so rewarding. Still is. That, that's amazing. In up until then, what were some of your early musical influences? Um, we'll come from London. It was like. It, it was a hotbed of, of the music industry. You know, it was, you know, the Stones, the Beatles would come through and every band that ever, ever played would, would come through London and, and kind of, 
it had this thing. It was the Stones, it was the Who, it was later on, it was the Sex Pistols. And all, all of these different bands, um, you know, had, had a big kind of uh, thing in London. It was a very cultural thing and it, it kind of represented. And then all the other stuff, you know, reggae music, you know, there was, there was a lot of um, immigrants from like, you know, the West Indies, like Jamaica and stuff like that. So it was, it was just a, a hotbed, a, a, a mixture of all these great different, you know, musical styles and, and events going on that you kind of took it for granted. I, I certainly did. I was like, well, this is really cool. Until I got to America and then it was, you know, Amer it's in Americans' DNA. They created rock music, obviously come from the blues and, and it kind of went on to different kind of uh, veins, if you like, you know, funk and soul, rock and roll, jazz, blues, pop music. It all came from blues. And it's, uh, it was fascinating to come to America and, and to, to, to the home of that. And us in England, we were just doing a copy of it. You know, the, the Zeppelins and the Stones, everyone was, was just kind of copying that American music. And coming to the, uh, to the mecca of, of that kind of style of music was, was fascinating for me. Yeah, at your house, I saw your library and I saw a lot of Motown uh, right. as well. Big, big Motown fan, absolutely, just growing up. And uh, again, you know, if you ever get a chance to go to Detroit, uh, Barry Gordy had this house that is, and it's a huge success story in itself. It was, you, you know, it, they were struggling. It was, it was a, a black family. They bought a house and they would lend money to, to family members and, and they would invest back into it. And then he bought a house next door. He made that the recording studio and like all of those hits, like the Temptations, Diana Ross. And this, Diana Ross was a, a receptionist there, by the way, when she was like wow. a teenager. But it, it was such a great success story and, and inspiration was the key. Like you walk in there and it's just inspiring. So again, if you ever, ever want to go to, to get some real inspiration, not, not just from a musical point of view, but from a, a business point of view and the fact that everyone kind of uh, jumped in and actually got their hands dirty and made this thing work. It was, it was more than just like a, 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 this massive empire. It started real, you know, grassroots, you know, cottage industries type stuff. That's a big endorsement because you've traveled the world. You've seen so many things. So early on, you got this band girl and then yeah. your friend, Steve Clark was the, the, the thing that got you introduced to Joe Elliott and Def Leppard. Well, I'm I, sure I there's, yeah. oh, there's a, a bunch of other stuff, but you know, I, I, we were on, on tour, a girl would play like the, the British clubs and pubs and all of that stuff. And we met Def Leppard. They already had two albums out. So, um, yeah, we became friends and we'd, we'd hang out together and, and stuff like that. And it just kind of, I, one day, you know, Joe called me and said, hey, you, we've, Pete is not in the band anymore, Pete Willis. And uh, do you want to play some guitar solos on this record? I said, yeah, sure. I just went down there and it ended up being Pyromania. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a photograph and, you know, Rock to Your Drop, Rock of Ages, Falling, all of that. And then I ended up singing on there, doing backing vocals and, real fun stuff and uh, and it, it exploded we had no idea actually it was, and it, it that was it then and it all changed from that point onwards recently i think it was vh1 or mtv did a, a documentary on the making of hysteria i believe and that was you were on it and joe was on it and that was just so powerful to watch they're really cool they've done this series called uh classic albums and it was, it was a while ago actually but um they were, they were really good. There's a, a Pink Floyd one, Dark Side of the Moon. There's yeah. a Sex Pistols one and our one. And I, I get swept away just what, even watching our one. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. I, stuff you find out you didn't even know about yourself. But yeah, they, they were really well done. And that, that, that was a great series, actually. Yeah, and, it, and we've talked about it before. You've talked about Mutt Lang. And I think Joe had that quote that there's... Uh, producers he's worked with that they become great friends but at the end you know he's not happy with the work or but with with uh, mud it was you hate him in the beginning but you love him at the end well I got total inspiration from that he's the most influential person in my musical career without a doubt you know um, it was like going to your, your favorite sub you would learn so much and and when you find someone who, who's totally inspiring and is is the, the highest intellect I've ever met in my life. He's, he's like, and he, he, you wouldn't even know that. You get into a conversation, then you go a little deeper and you go, oh, wow, this guy is a giant. This guy's a giant. He's been, he's been 
humble, he's being modest and all of that. And he's also like that with the music as well. So we learned so much. I learned how to sing from him and how to play guitar properly, you know, without, without even knowing it. You'd, you'd go, well, try this, try this. It'd, it'd just have a way of actually introducing you and getting you to excel, actually. And so it's a, it was a, a, an amazing um, way of doing things. You know, it's, it's very rare, that, that kind of thing. You know, it's almost a spiritual thing. And adding the singing really that that's benefited you because you've done back background vocals. You have two other bands we're going to talk about where you sing. Uh, you do the majority of singing, and I think of people like Neil Young and Stevie Ray Vaughan and and guitar players that decided it wasn't their first craft to sing, but they decided to sing. Johnny Lang would probably fall into that as well, and yeah. it's really served them well. It's one of the most important things. I, when, when anyone says to me, uh, when they, they're starting playing a guitar, someone, a, a parent says, my son's playing guitar, you know, what should he, you got any tips? I say, yeah, can he sing? I always say that's the first thing. They go, well, I don't know. I say, you need to. You need to be able to express yourself full, full round, you know, in the whole kind of enchilada. And, um, and it also improves the confidence. You know, I think there's a, there's a thing, a lot of people pick up a guitar because they're a little intimidated and it's, it's, it's kind of a great way to, to get out of your shell but with, and, and remain within it as well. But w when you're singing, that's a whole different bag of things. You, you've got to, especially if you get out there and, and uh, sing in front of people, you know, almost naked. I don't mean naked. I mean, you know, with no effects or without a band. And uh, also it, it does something else. I, you know, when the American Idol thing came out, um, I didn't really like the fact that that, that kind of, touch on the meanness of of humanity you know you would, people would poke fun they would laugh at someone who, who screwed up and um you know it just goes back to when people would pay to go in asylums and poke people and it's like horrible horrible human trait and i actually noticed a bit of that when, when that came out you know people would laugh that but with some people they, they didn't care and they got over that hump and i think that long story short just that the singing thing and the confidence that that, that you that allows you it, it affects you in other areas of your life you know if you can actually get up there and sing and not really care it it will improve other uh, things in your life and if you're a musician it really takes you somewhere else I, I again i've got a friend who's just an amazing bass player and i heard him singing once and i was like i, I can't believe you i said you you actually sound like a, a lead singer that, that plays bass and craig martin he played on the g3 uh tour with us and uh yeah we're actually doing something right now actually but um he is actually a singer so he, he just developed that he just tweaked it a little bit and he's just just an amazing singer that that plays incredible bass so yeah that is a really important thing i think and then the next thing on top of that would be writing you know yeah. if you can sing and then you can write i think of a, a taylor swift again she was a writer yeah. first and her singing caught up Absolutely. And, and that, that's, that happens a lot until they, they kind of uh, meet in the middle there somewhere. And, and then you don't even realize it happening. You know, one, one of these other things catches up and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a songwriter. I'm, I'm a producer. I'm a, I'm a singer. I'm whatever. Or you can be all the above. And, and that's, that's really cool if you can actually do that, if you can achieve that. So when you write, do you tend to write more on the music side or do you also write lyrics? Both. It just it always it can be a drum beat actually a lot of the time I, I you know you'll hear a car go by or, or you know back in the days when we walk out in the street in cities and stuff you know you'd hear something coming out of a, a window or, or on a car and I've, I've done it many times and gone oh yeah that's really cool and it, it makes you sing or think of something else or a phrase or a word it, it can be any of those things and I, I'm I don't even look out for them they actually they they come and they 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 come out through the air almost, you know, and you go, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. I had no idea. And before you know it, you have a song written. That's a common theme. I, I love watching documentaries and watching interviews with artists. And the common theme is these songs get channeled. They get downloaded. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure yeah. yesterday, you know, Paul wrote that in less than 30 minutes, you know, things Fine. like that. And so you can relate to that. You can agree with that. Absolutely. It's not a hundred percent of the time, but occasionally yes. a or, handful or of get, times you just, definitely, yeah. Definitely. Like, you know, you'll get a, a chorus and you, Oh my God, this is great. 
and that they say you know was it 10 percent inspiration 90 percent perspiration right. so right. You, you kind of you get that and you you're, you're swinging away it's great you got verse one and then you go and what should verse two be about and then you can spend <laughs> a year on, on verse two but not not literally but yeah sometimes but so so it's but the inspiration when that hits you it's it's, it's fantastic and you just you, you just you're grateful for the muse whatever that was you know I think it was John Fold, Fogarty said he was, he started journaling and one day it just came so strong. He wrote down proud Mary. And then a month later he got some little beat in his head. And then a month later he got this little verse and then he remembered writing down proud Mary. And he said, I knew it was going to be huge, but it came That's in these three different little drops. That, that's amazing. And what's really interesting, what you just said, I, I was in, um, where is it? Eugene, Oregon, sitting in, in, in a Starbucks. And a guy went past on a motorcycle and he's singing Proud Mary. He's just singing uh, they're, they're really loud. Like, <laughs> right. And then on the radio or thing, uh, Tina Turner's version came on. Mm -hmm. up, and it wasn't like he, he hadn't heard it. And that come on, he, he sung that, he left. Then the song came on, so it was it was a really interesting thing, and that song in particular was it was it was interesting that you said that, yeah, because yeah, it's no, definitely it, got some stuff out there. And you guys have had some songs, you know, mega songs like "Pour Some Sugar on Me." I, I'm sure almost every song has a story, but what's the story behind that one? Well, we'd basically finished the Hysteria album, which was hard work you know rick rick had lost his arm in a terrible accident during that you know we we with different different studios different countries two and a half years and we'd pretty much finished we'd gone so much in debt that it was actually brought tears to my eyes when i when i read the breakdown i was like oh my it, we this is done we're never going to pay this back to the record company we're going to be constantly in debt and um we had to sell a ridiculous amount of albums to break even and uh Joe was sitting in the hallway and he's like, oh, to get on me. and Mutt Lang goes, what's that? He said, oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. He said, play that again. And, and so the next 10 days we wrote and recorded this song and, and you know, the rest of, like I said, two and a half years with all the other stuff, that song was 10 days and it was the last thing to, to go on there. And it, and it, you know, broke the album. I, I mean, the, we had three singles out before that and they didn't really do it. We, we hadn't broken even by a long shot. That one came out and again, very interesting story. It was um, strip clubs in Florida. The girls would request the song and then it started getting popular on the radio. They'd request it locally and then it become this massive song in, in Florida near all the strip clubs. And, and we had no idea. And then all of a sudden it's just bang, it exploded. And then, uh, it's that tipping point thing. You know, you've, you've read the book, Tipping Point. Right, it's like, right. Whether it's hush puppies or whatever it is, all of a sudden <laughs> it goes, and, and, and it kind of goes into a, another, it reorbits, And that's what happened with that. And it was, it, was, it was absolutely the tipping point thing with that song. So, Phil, you know, just hearing that story and, and again, the serendipity of the album's finished and then here comes that song and Joe happens to sing it and Mutt happens to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's hear that again. And you guys already felt like you had put more than you could put into the album. And yeah, saying all that to say, uh, how often do you just go, this is, I've, I've just, we've just been so fortunate. Why have I, what is it that has put me in this position to keep having such good fortune? Because you, you've also played with so many amazing musicians, just not, Def Leppard, but so many bands, so many musicians produced, been guest spots on other people's albums. What do you attribute that to? Um, we're very fortunate. And, and honestly, a lot of the stuff, we just had great people around us. You know, obviously, Mutt Lang was, was the most important thing. But, you know, even our management, um, at the time, it was Q Prime, as uh, Peter mentioned, Cliff Bernstein, and they... Uh, they really nurtured us. They, they kind of kept the record company at bay. They, they, you know, all of that stuff, it, it was really good. And, and, and then when we moved on to Howard Kaufman, same deal. It was, there was a, a, a completely different approach. And Mike Kobayashi, who managed us now, that is, is 
it exploded, you know, and, and it's really, you having a, a team is, is fantastic. And that's really what that was about. We've just been really fortunate to have that. And, and also within the band, you know, you, it's a, we've been together 30, uh, 38 years I've been in the band. Like last week it was 38 years or something, which is ridiculous. So it's a family and you know, all the cliches are all true. It's um, you go through all this stuff, but it's uh, something you learn from you. You're constantly absorbing this stuff that, that, that makes it successful. It's like, well, well what is it that's doing that? And, and you, you're learning the whole time. Yeah, which brings us to the whole Rick Allen story, because here you're talking about the team and the group. And again, you guys, um, you really have been a great example of a, of a family and a band and not that everything's perfect and not that there's not different uh, personalities inside the group. But, you know, when Rick, well, again, first Steve Clark, you guys lost Steve, right? And well, that, that, was, was, that was after Rick. That was that was after the Hysteria tour, actually. It was the, yeah. But um, yeah, Rick had the accident in '84, I think, New Year's Eve '84. Wow. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about it. Where um, yeah, you know, when you lose an arm, it's not like you can even sit up straight without effort. Right. Like you're leaning over, and it took massive amounts of rehabilitation. So even the thought that he could return as the drummer would have been uh, not even something a lot of bands would have even thought would be possible. But you guys said, hey, let's give it a shot. Well, as a team effort, we actually asked him what he wanted to do, you know, because Rick didn't have a plan B. As, as, you know, as much as I always say, have a plan A, B, C, D, F, G, because a lot of the time, you know, A or B doesn't work. Just make sure you're not too disappointed to dredge up, you know, plan F or something. But Rick in life didn't have a plan B. He was, he was a drummer. That was it. So Mark Langer went and actually saw him in hospital and said, look, you know, you, there's all this technology. You can use your foot. You've got this amazing uh, kick drum, bass pedal technique anyway. Why don't you apply that to some of this? And it was an antiquated stuff now, but his, his drum kit now is like ridiculous. It's like just <laughs> so cool. But um, back then, you know, he talked him into it and he said, really? He said, you think? He said, yeah. He said, you, you just have to change one limb for the other. And, and it's double work for the feet, but it's, you, you can do it. So he, he was practicing on the bed. And when me and Steve Clark went to visit him in hospital, he was, he was practicing that between his foot and, 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 you know, just the one arm and, and he, he got it working and it was very frustrating for him. I remember because we lived in the house together, me, Steve and Rick lived in this place in Donnybrook in um, Dublin, just outside Dublin. And uh, he would practice from eight in the morning till about 10 at night. And, and it would be really frustrating. It'd be swearing and cursing. And all of a sudden in one day, there was no cursing and you heard a, a rhythm and it was cool. It was in time and it was kind of, and it just got better from then. It just, and it, and it went on and on and on and just, you know, it was a very inspirational thing. Again, back to that word, you know, it's, it was inspiring for him because he could hear the, hear the difference. And, and then for us as well, we didn't hear him cursing all the time and getting frustrated. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of cool, you know, the, he kind of got to that next level and then was able to keep taking it to another level to, to it was second nature, you know. And again, Mutt gets brought up again. So Mutt really impacted you guys and the trajectory of your career and didn't know that part about Mutt going and yeah. saying, hey, you can, like he was that first Definitely. guy that, yeah, he, he had a vision in other words. Yes, yeah, very much so, but very logical as well. Like um, he, he's like that all, all the time. We go, well, why does it have to be that way? Why can't you do it this way? It seems more effective and more efficient and logical if you do this. And, and you go, wow, really? Well, really? That's, that's, that's fascinating. And, and always the way, you know? So how did you guys meet Mutt? What was the, what got that going? Because he'd worked with what? Uh, Black Sabbath ACDC. and ACDC? Yeah. He, he was, um, you know, Brian Adams, ACDC, The Cars, he had a lot, lot of different bands, you know, Tina Turner. And uh, he'd just come off of the ACDC album and then mentioned Bernstein Q Prime, our, our old management. Um, managed to hook him into the Def Leppard production thing. And uh, that, that, that's what, you know, that's, that's what started it off basically. And then, then he saw something in the band and, and said, you know, I, I think these guys are malleable and, and I can 
there's something there that I could improve on. So, uh, and absolutely, and that, that was the thing. The fact that we listened to it, it wasn't like, you know, some musicians get very egoed out and upset when people, you know, tell them to do something else and that, without, without saying, oh, you're doing that wrong, you say, well, why don't you try this? It's just another approach. It's, and that's all it's down to. But uh, some people, especially musicians, there's, a, there's an ego that comes with, with some of that, that that won't let them do that. We did, and we were younger, and, and it, was, it was fascinating to, to be part of that. I just watched a documentary about World Canyon, right? The, all the musicians that came together, and they were talking about, in England, the producers were like the, the stars. You know, the producers were the ones that the artist had to almost answer to where in America it was totally different. And so it was Ringo and these guys saying, yeah, it was just a totally different vibe there. Is that, can you see a little bit of that truth? Was that a little bit of the vibe or had it changed by then? It, it changed by then. And then the really successful, even going back to the Motown stuff, that was, that was all about the producers because like the, the band, that they, they were local jazz musicians, the guys that played on that Motown stuff. And I know for a fact that they must have thought, well, this is only three chords. This is really below me. You know, this is like kind of, until they got in there and then they put the top line on and then it's like, yeah, maybe everything is all right, uptight, out of sight. And then they go, oh, wow, this is, you know, you have a genius musician walking in the door with Stevie Wonder and, and, it, and all of a sudden it changes everything. And then they got into that whole thing. But yeah, the, the, the producer and, the, and that, that vision was very important. So you say, same with a lot of the stuff, American stuff, you know, big, big producers, even, even stuff like uh, the Beach Boys, you know. Um, it, it, it was, it, you hear that stuff and that's, you know, Pet, pet Sounds is what um, Sergeant Peppers was based on. Right. You know, they heard that and it's like Brian Wilson was like the producing God, if you like. So that they really, you needed that kind of uh, figure to, to get the stuff out there, really. So uh, there's so much, so many directions we could go related to the music. Uh, but I'm, I maybe want to talk a little guitars. How much are you a guitar guy and an amp guy and all the little bells and whistles that go with that. How much is that part of your sound? And I, I, it's really funny. I've been listening to like some of this old stuff from the eighties, these demos and that, and I've been through different amplifiers and all this stuff and different guitars. It sounds the same. It still sounds <laughs> like me playing. So it's, it's a preference thing. And it really gear guitars, uh, come down to a thing. Um, that, what makes you feel good? There's no <laughs> cookie cutter thing, you know? Yeah. Like the first, electric guitar was Leo Fender made the, the Telecaster. It was called a broadcaster before a, a, a snake head, gate head or whatever it was called initially. And that's a really great guitar. They, you, they, it was it, right straight from the, from the get go. My Jackson, my PC one is a, is a hybrid of, of a lot of different guitars, a Stratocaster, a Telecaster, a Les Paul. It's got, you know, the wood is a, a like one guitar and I've got all this titanium stuff. So it's hot rodded. So it's down to a preference. You know, it's a, if, if someone goes, well, you know, I love driving a Ferrari or I, I prefer a Porsche or whatever. And then someone goes, well, I'd rather just get in a, te a Tesla and just get it done with. And it's just there, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's a preference. And it, if it makes you, if it inspires you to do something, that's the thing. I, I get inspired by playing my guitars. They're set up, the neck is huge. That's how I like it. And the, the amplifier, the, I'm, I'm using this thing now that's called um, a fractal. And it wasn't until they got the Mark III. So you, to, you could do away with all the other gear, all pedals, equipment, you know, effects and all of that. It's just a rack mounted thing that with two little speakers and they're a thousand watts, these atomics uh, speakers. And that, to me, that's, that, that's been my best sound ever. So, you know, Vegas last year was, was, was pretty much the, the apex of my sound. That's what I've been trying to, and you always, I'm, I'm such a nerd with it anyway. I'm always trying to, you know, improve on it. And you know, you, that, that perfect sound, that perfect guitar, that perfect amplifier. But you know, the bo bottom line is you can, you can still get the stuff out of something a, a lot less. Right. Uh, uh, one of my friends, Michael Gomez, he's a musician. He's the band Mercy Me. And done really well and and he asked a question for me to ask you sure and he said do you still play a Kemper profiler 
nowadays? I don't. I never actually played one of them. I, I okay. play the, the Fractal. It's, it's a similar, it came out at the same time. The Kemper, would, would, you, could, um, you could copy a sound. You could go, okay, I've my 50 Watt Marshall, which I used on the Pyromania album, I, from, from my girl 50 Watt Marshall, I just stuck that in, plugged that into to whatever they were using. That's what you hear on Photograph and Rock of Ages. That's the sound, you know. But with a Kemper, you can actually copy that. I've, I've never actually worked one, so I, it, I'm sure it's great. But uh, I, I just got into the Fractal thing, and I, I use these little Black Star amps when I'm doing little club gigs or Delta Deep stuff. I, I, you know, I can get a, a great sound for, for that kind of thing. But when you're playing a stadium and it's in-ear monitors and all that stuff, for me, the Fractal's the best thing so far. So, Phil, I met you in 2013, and HBO was about to do a, a big special uh, with you guys. And then you went out on tour, I believe, with Kiss, that first tour. And you thought, hey, you know, it might be a year, and then we'll see what happens. Well, that tour just never, it's it just one tour after another, right? You've yeah. now, uh, you went out with Styx and with Poison and uh, most recently Journey and multiple other bands. And it's been amazing. And at the same time, you've had two other bands you occasionally do some stuff with. You just mentioned one, Delta Deep, and I've seen you guys, and you're amazing. And I have a signed uh, CD uh, of you guys, uh, Debbie Blackwell Cook, who's in one of the best singers ever. I was sitting on a plane with Tommy uh, Shaw of Sticks, and he just went on and on about, you're the nicest guy and phenomenal guitar player, and Debbie is the best singer. Oh, but also cool. when I was at your house, uh, you said, hey, we've got some guests. I hope it's okay. Well, one of them was Paul Cook of the Sex Pistols. Yeah. And uh, you and, and Paul signed a uh, CD, uh, Man Rays. And so this is another band. You've done, what, two or three albums yeah. with Man Rays? Again, amazing. Uh, like, I love the title, funk, root, or Punk, Funk, Roots, and Rock. Yeah. I mean, it really is just earthy good stuff and delta hey. deep is just like it says i mean you guys are it's pure blues amazing love watching you in concert and that has uh that's an incredible band the the members uh the bass player is oh yeah uh, robert de yeah stone, stone temple yeah. pilot and forced uh robinson well, nominal yeah. drummer and debbie's incredible singer so you stay busy my friend uh no, I mean, there's always stuff coming out. So there's always stuff writing and recording. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And on both, well, with Man Race, you do all the singing, right? Yeah. And with Delta Deep, Debbie does the majority, but you sing quite yeah. a bit on that as well. Yeah. So that's the thing. And I think what's going to happen, I mean, what this is funny because Paul Cook said this. He said, you know what? We shouldn't have done it, called it Man Race. It should have been your solo album. I think it would have got more heat for it you know it would have hmm. been out there and so I, i've got all this stuff lying i've got man ray songs that, that we'll finish off with the band i've got delta deep stuff that we'll finish off and as i so at some point i may actually do that you should and you've yeah, got so many fun. collaborators you can bring in yeah and speaking of collaboration uh so i know you produced the tesla album right and then yeah. you did the tour with g3 right that, incredible yeah, oh my god yeah. talk a little bit about that um, well, G3 is, is gu guitar players. It's, it's, um, it's a theater tour, and they've been doing it for years. It's, it's, it's three guitar players. It's Joe Satriani, and he chooses two other guys. So this particular tour, it was John Petrucci from G Dream Theater, who's insane. I don't know if you ever check that out. It's like he's played some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and me, and, and so we, we took Delta Deep. Um, Robert DeLeo couldn't make the tour, so Craig Martini stepped in and uh, played bass. Who, who's fantastic um, as well. And uh, it, it was just so much fun. Those guys are, again, for being so talented and over the top musicianship, uh, they are so humble. And again, you know, it, it kind of, it, it's teary eyed almost seeing someone be that humble, being that such a monster musician. So it's, uh, I, we love that. It was, it was a winter tour. So we were out there in, in the elements. It was like, you know, Minneapolis in February, you know, it's like, 
<laughs> January and February. So yeah, but we had a blast. It was it was really good, and it, and it added a, another thing to it because we were singing obviously, and, and it had a wasn't just guitar playing. So the whole night was 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 an amazing event. I've got to say, each night. I remember Jim Rohn? I booked him once for Fargo in February, <laughs> and yeah. I've never heard the end of it. He he for years he was like Kyle, Florida in February. Yep. Fargo in June, right? And yes. uh, I was just sitting in my office. I didn't have to go, so I didn't know any better, right? It's, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, you know, Jim would always say traveling is the hard part. You know, getting up and speaking is the easy part. How much is a tour? How much is traveling? Especially you're into fitness. Right. You know, talk a little bit about touring if, and if that's what actually limits a lot of bands from actually – being able to go out there. It's just, it's right. hard on, it's hard on, it's hard all the way around. It, it's financially <clears throat> strapping. It's like, we, we did a, a man race tour we, once, actually in January again, it's like, what? In England, which is ex even worse, you know? So Fargo in England is, yes, yeah, about the same, you know? So it was Scotland and, and England with Alice Cooper. But we couldn't afford to, stay in hotels, we had to make the bus. Actually, we did that on the G3 tour as well. It's so easy to spend money when you don't have to. So we'd go, okay, we'll get a day room that we'll share and, and everyone can go in there. And it was a similar thing. And we, we got this old bus that if, if you put the heat on, the kettle wouldn't work because it would blow the fuse. So, but it was all we could afford for the tour. And it was, it was stunning, it was amazing. So I think a lot of the time, you've got to be very uh, aware that, that it's, you know, uh, people imagine that people are throwing money at that, that this imaginary money comes from somewhere and it doesn't, you know, it's like when you record a record, you know, it costs so much money. That's why people don't do it anymore. They do it at right. home uh, and touring's the same thing. Um, I love being a tourist. I, I mean, I get up early in the morning anyway, I get up and walk out and take in the normally, you know, you know, COVID permitting, I, I would be out there now somewhere on tour and I would be getting up at six in the morning, finding a, a, a somewhere to have a coffee and just take absorbing the local feel and, and vibe wherever it is, whether it's in Florida or Fargo, of which I've done many times, actually. I, I remember playing chess in Fargo with my son Rory when he was like nine. And it was, it was winter as well. And we were sitting in a coffee shop playing chess and it was like wow and it was just a great memory you know you so I, I really enjoy that stuff the traveling stuff can get a bit much but if you're on a tour bus I, I go asleep I'm, I'm asleep before we leave the parking lot and I wake up in the next town usually so that's really good and then the the, the, the you have a workout and then or two workouts depend on whatever it is and then you got the show and, and it, it's a really great day actually in my I, for me looking at it some people they don't like it and there you go and they don't see their family you know my family comes out you know I have five kids they come out in at different parts so when we were at last year we were in uh, Europe and my two girls uh, came out to to some of the Scandinavian countries and then I met Helen and, and Jackson we, we were in Prague and Milan and, and then, you know, I go back and see Samantha and then Rory, whenever, you know, he came out to Hawaii and New Zealand and stuff. Yeah, you love it. And you, um, you're very fastidious about working out and keeping your regimen. And so let's, let's transition into fitness. Uh, you've been a vegan for how many years now? Well, I've been a really strict vegetarian for 36 or 37 years. So that, and then I stopped drinking about 33 years ago. And they really help. And, and I didn't do it for those reasons. I did it because I would, I couldn't stop drinking. I would start blacking out and then you go, oh, I did what last night? Oh my God, really? And I was able to stop. And, you know, my best friend, Steve Clark, wasn't. And, you know, and it ended up killing him. Um, so I was able to do that. The food thing, it, it was a, a morale thing. It was moral. So it was like, I, I, I couldn't eat this stuff. It was like a dead body. So for me, I had to stop eating that stuff. But um, the benefits from working out is that you keep, it's the fountain of youth. I, that's the way I look at it. You know, I'm 62 now and I've, I've just been doing this um, thing, actually, the 30 day workout fitness challenge. Because when I found out we were doing, um, the, the tour had been pushed back literally a year. 
it was, um, I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to pig out. I'm going to have 30, 30 cheat days. You know, that normally you have it over Christmas and it may 10 days or two weeks maybe. Like, I had a month of just junk food and, you know, Pizza. cashew milk ice cream. Oh, <laughs> a, a version of it. Yeah, I actually, all of that, bread and, and, you know, vegan cheese and all of that stuff. And it was great. And then at the end, I was like, I feel stodgy. I don't feel myself. There's someone else has taken over my body. <laughs> so it was a bit like, you know, you remember Super Size Me? He, he goes yes. on a, a, a bender of, of like junk food, like hitting all the, you know, McDonald's and Burger King. I don't know, like a vegan version of that. And it was great. But I, what, it's funny, only when I stopped and, and started eating how I normally did, did I notice that it was it, how much it had affected me. It slowed me down to the point now I hadn't realized it was actually doing that. And I think that going back to the, the, the fountain of youth thing, b moving and keeping the blood flowing and eating something that's, that's okay, absolutely keeps you young. Because if you don't, the alternative is it slows down. You don't even notice it. Um, uh, again, uh, years ago, I read this thing that this guy had, um, I think it was a 32 inch waist when he was at school. And he'd got older and he still wore these jeans and they, they were just uh, getting bigger and, and, and everything. And his stomach started going over the belt line. So he didn't notice it and, until one day he looked in the mirror and went, oh, and because he was so much overweight and he's, it, it, the jeans had tricked him. And this sounds like a, a, you know, like a story, but this is actually true. Um, and he was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm like, you know, 40 pounds, 50 pounds heavier than I was. And I was kidding myself because my stomach is now over where the belt line used to be. So it, it made him go on a diet. And he obviously kept the genes until he was able to do it up again. But it was, it, that's what happens. It, it tricks you into to feeling unhealthy or, or so. And before you know it, you go, oh my God. I'd, some, and a lot of people can't do anything about it or they're, or they're not able to. But you can, I think it's just a, it's just a matter of baby steps and, that, and that's it. Yeah, and you, uh, you're you known for being out on stage without a shirt on and just totally ripped. And again, the six pack and all that, that takes a lot of work. Uh, so I know you are uh, love martial arts. You're very in involved in martial arts. You eat healthy. But then to be on touring shape, it even takes that next step. So when you did the 30 days of kind of eat what you want, were you still working out? Absolutely. I'm... I'm but not like I'm, I'm still on the, the, the 30 day fitness challenge right now, actually. Yeah. I'm just coming towards the end of it, but I was still working out, but not to, not to the de degree I would be. And, and then obviously a touring thing is up a few more notches as well. It's, and, and the, the, it's really interesting. Six packs are mainly a result of low body fat more than anything else is actually when you get your body fat down there, I'm still like, 10 I, I'm way off on my on my body fat where I should be but it's, it's okay it's, it's, it's I've got a year to get back there and that's the way I'm looking at it so it's it's fascinating and I actually feel really good because I've been working mm -hmm. out every day for, for a month you know well as you mentioned you're 62 and I, I remember talking to Tommy Shaw of sticks and he's like we can't tour if we're not in shape. We can't Absolutely. tour if we're drinking or doing drugs. And Phil was such an amazing influence. And then Jenny Cook, who's Paul Cook's wife, would come and do raw, yeah. raw, um, vegan food. food. Yeah, yeah. vegan food. And yeah, and just how helpful that was. But have you, have you, has the band found that out? Listen, if we're going to tour and we're going to tour five, six years in a row, there's this to, to be able to absolutely. perform. Yeah, absolutely. We, we take a trainer out now. And, and, uh, and again, you know, like the last time we played, we were in Vegas. So every morning, actually, um, Eric, the trainer was, was, was coming out, but we also had, um, uh, he's the, the guys that work with him. Yeah. He's, he's, he's just got this incredible kind of network. And, um, we, we would every morning we would get up five or six of us, and Jake, who's his, one of his guys, he's 23 years old, would get us every morning, 6.30, we'd go to Starbucks, we'd, we'd have something, and then we would all work out really hardcore for an hour every single day that we were there. We were there for a month. 
So you, you would do that. And then later on, I'd, I'd do a second workout just before I went on stage. So yeah, it, it made a huge difference. And, and, and the guys in the band absolutely realized that for sure. Martial arts, you, you have fought competitively at one time, right? Well, not, not really. I mean, I've, I've just trained really and, and occasionally jumped in a ring. So, you know, and, and just done sparring, but not, nothing kind of, you know, hardcore. But uh, again, I, I find that, I find martial arts, uh, again, one of the keys to, to youth. I mean, it's like, I know you mentioned Tommy Shoy. I know he does yoga, which is great. Tommy's in such great shape. And considering he's, he's you know, been doing this for so long, he, he looks like a kid, you know, and that's, it's so important. He eats right and he does the yoga. For me, I, the martial arts just loosens the hips up and I'd, I'd never have any back problems or legs or a lot of people do. You know, they'll, they'll stand up and they'd be creaky. Um, I find if I do stop doing martial arts training, I start feeling like that. So it's the Dorian Gray thing. You can't ever, you, you have to keep the painting in, in, the, <laughs> in the room. You know, you, you have to keep that to keep you young. You know what I mean? There's the painting gets older. So yeah, so for me, the martial arts thing is, is another one of those things that, um, that helps the, the, the body stay, stay limby, you know? On the 30 day challenge, is that something people can follow? Yeah, yeah, it's, media. On, it's on the Def Leppard uh, website. And, you know, it's, I'm not going into depth with it. Obviously, I do about an hour a day. But, and it just has a, a brief, like, two minute, this is what I'm doing today type thing. And then I, I, I write down what I've eaten that, that particular day as well. Well, let's shift over to personal development now. And you, you mentioned Tommy Shaw. And I think when I met him, just one of the nicest human beings. Wonderful. One of the, yeah, you're one of the nicest human beings. Every time I've been around you, I was at your son's birthday party and there's 25, 30 people. And yet you're paying attention to everyone else of how can you serve. It's, it's just incredible. And you mentioned some of these other musicians that you find are just really great people, very humble. But not everyone's that way. You know, whether right. we're talking musicians, athletes, whatever. But is that a skill set that you've mm -hmm. learned over time? Is that the way it's always been? Or is it something you've kind of learned the hard way to, to say, you know, that's not going to serve me well. I want to. No, I've always been that way, actually. Okay. And I do see people who don't do that. And I see them, it not serving them well. Yeah. They, they over, you know, the, the interesting thing, I actually still feel like I'm, that age when I joined the deaf level, which was like, I was 24, I think. I st still really feel that. Only I have all this experience that, that I've garnered on the way, you know, all, all the stuff we've been talking about. You, you do that. And I've also seen how people act and treat each other and what it actually does. And I, even from a physical point of view, I, I, I see it kind of um, deteriorating people mentally, physically, it, it does nasty things to them when, when, they're, when they're, they're kind of that way inclined. And I, I've never really understood it. And, and it, it, it's, usually, it's usually the ego, it comes from an ego-based thing. And it's, um, but I, I think you can avoid it. I think it's, it's easier, it's nicer on, on your body, uh, you're like physically, mentally, everything. If you're, you know, the sugar versus vinegar thing, you know, you get more from, from, from being sweet. It's cool. And you mentioned at one time you were drinking, you were having blackouts. And yeah. I think of musicians that oftentimes have had tragic ends, whether it was fatal or whether it was just, you know, it caused them a lot of personal harm. Yeah. Maybe it was drugs. Maybe it was alcohol. Maybe it was some addictions. Do you think that that would have taken you down like when you see some of the other people that maybe are the opposite of what we're talking about, yeah. is it sometimes addictions that get in the way? Absolutely. Without a doubt. I mean, like, like I said, I, I noticed, I recognized the addiction thing. Getting, I, the fact that I couldn't remember things was, was like really weird. You know, I'd, I'd be, didn't know where I was. I'd be driving a car, blind drunk. And it's like, wow, you know, I could have hit someone. This is crazy. Yeah. So all of these things really weighed on me. And, and I was like, I, I, I quit cold turkey. I, I tried a few times before. I tried to do the social drink. I thought, I'll have a 
a glass of wine with the thing. Couldn't do it. It'd be like the bottle of wine. And then it was Jack Daniels by the end of the week. And so it wasn't till um, my ex-girlfriend, Liz, uh, it was her birthday. And then this was 1987, uh, April 87. And we were in Paris and, and she's, it was her birthday. And we had a glass of champagne. I said, I'm not drinking after this. And we went to India the next day. And we went there and, and I quit cold turkey and that was it. And it was really easy. And she did it with me, you know. And I, I found it's so, the benefits was outrageous. I, I got two hours extra in a day, literally, where I wasn't recovering or just feeling, you know, not great. And that's when I started working out because I actually had time to burn. And I thought, you know, what can I do? I, I'm going to go for a run. And not that I was into running, but I, I, that, that kind of started that thing off. And it was, it was inspiring. It was, uh, and, and you know, I, I, when I started doing it, I was in Dublin and I'd run along the shoreline just out south of Dublin, even in the cold weather. And it was just like, this is really cool. It wasn't the running part. It was just like being the nature part and the fact that I wasn't, I just felt different because I wasn't a uh, nurse in hangover or something. I had this clear, clean version of me. Powerful. So when I talk about personal development, when I met you, you knew who Jim Rohn was and you, yeah. like you mentioned outliers in these different books or tipping point. And uh, you actually wrote your own book. And again, that's a lot of work, right? More work yeah. than most people would realize. Absolutely. Uh, adrenalized life, death leopard and beyond. What was your motivation to do the book? Um, Chris Epton, who, who actually, whose idea it was, said, you should write a book. I said, oh, no. He said, no, no, it's fantastic. There's some great stories. So he, he got this thing together and he said, all right, look, I'll show you. I'll get some interest from, from some book companies. And uh, Simon & Schuster is, is uh, the company that put it out. And uh, so we did. And uh, it went back and forth. There was some editor stuff. And, and then Helen helped me as well. We, we, we kind of sat down and went back and re-edited the whole thing you know books the whole process is very it's a lot harder than people think yeah you know like a song or or anything else it's like you know i recently wrote a story a short story and i'm not a writer I, it just it came out this story so i'm i don't know what i'm gonna do with that yet but it's uh <laughs> it, it was a short story and it's like well that's that was weird uh, and i had another one which i was i was working on and uh then Are the they virus are they happen. personal development type stories? No, or not even the... slightly. They're, okay. they're, they're novel and they're really dark. Okay, and so so not it's more than a story. Is it a book? Like a, a small fiction yes, book? It's going to be, yeah. I, I was thinking if I do the two, that would make a great book. It, two short stories would, would make a really great little book. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I've got that. And, and again, I just had these ideas. It's just like writing a song, actually. It was like a story. And, and it developed and, and one of the other ones I, I had and it had this virus in it and then this whole thing hit and I thought well, you know what I can't write this because this has actually just happened in real life so I'll, I'll have to rethink that one but um, <laughs> yeah no it's, it's, it's funny uh, and but writing a book writing a story writing a song is is a lot more difficult than people think because it has to be it's all right you thinking it or spurting it out but when you actually have to write it down and all of those things. And is it right? Is it my getting the point across? Does it sound too highbrow? Or does it sound not highbrow? And all of these different things, you know, that, that, that come, come with writing a book. It's, it's, so it's an interesting thing. So Phil, you're very productive. And again, you guys have done really well. I mean, you guys were filling up arenas and then remember talking to Robert Alt, the founder of LA Music. He said, hey, it was a stadium when he saw you guys in Toronto with Journey. And it's been going on for a while now. So you stay productive just because you, what, you know, what's the reason that, are you driven as an artist? Are you driven to? I, I have um, songs going through my head all the time. They, they come up and so you, you can't ignore them. I mean, I honestly could sit down and, and write all day, every day. And I, I've actually, we, we just signed with Sony publishing and, uh, uh, one of the guys, Brian at, at Sony, has, has been really great. He's been hooking me up with a couple of Brian Monaco uh, with some different songwriters, and we've been going on like a storm, and like stuff that I wouldn't normally do, like just very different type of stuff. And it's 
again, it's, it's very inspiring to, to, to get into a different type of music or, or thing, you know. So I've been doing that and I, I'm always writing Def Leppard stuff, obviously. And, and so that, that's an ongoing thing. But I, I think that's it. And I, I'm, I'm just really excited about the band where it's gone. I, I think uh, Mike Kobayashi, who took over from Howard, that they, they, they had a plan. And we're following that, and it was it was just going from strength to strength to strength. And um, we obviously we just put our most successful tour ever on sale, and you know it's flying out the window. And then COVID hit, so it's like no. So we'll pick that up hopefully next year. You know, if everyone follows the the, the rules. I mean, you, I've got some friends in in you know Australia, England, Europe. And, and and they've been speaking. They go, no, we we actually got the the thing on the. We kind of locked it down. We done the four week lockdown here, and like way more extreme than we did. Like in, in in Ireland, you couldn't go out driving your car even. Wow! But they've got it down. They they've locked it down to the point they could enter these different phases. And we didn't do that. You know, I think New York was the only place that did that really successfully. And I think realistically we're going to have to do a version of that if we want to be back to any kind of modicum of normality aren't you glad uh 2014 2013 2014 after a five-year hiatus approximately that joe said yes let's go on tour versus yeah. the versus this year saying hey let's go on tour and then COVID hits oh yeah well you guys it, had that amazing seven years six seven absolutely. years absolutely yeah, I, and Joe lost his voice for a while as well, and and this he actually came back way stronger, and that was a bit scary for a while. He was like, "It's not coming back," and he didn't have the operation. And the, the, a couple of people were saying, "I know a surgeon, and they can do this thing, and it's the the nodes on your nodules in your throat, and we can get that done." And he didn't do it. He actually Roger Love, who's a, a vocal coach, I, I know Roger, and he was telling. <laughs> I've been to his studios, and he's like. Phil and Joe, I love these guys. <laughs> well, I love him. We, we, we especially love him after what he did. Again, raw food vegan. I hadn't seen him for 15 years. And he looked 15 years younger than when I saw him the last time after fit. I was like, whoa. And he said, yeah, raw food vegan, no coffee, no alcohol, totally wow. clean. And that, that again, that's, that's the, the fountain of youth. That, that and a bit of exercise, and it's amazing. But um, no, he, he actually coach Joe out of not even being able to speak back into the realm of singing better than he could when he was in his 20s. I, I swear to God, and I'm not just saying that, and I say this to Joe all the time. I said, you could never do this before. He said, no, no, it's amazing. So we've been writing some songs together and he's been doing this. And I'm like, this is, you've never sung like this. He said, wow. it's, it's amazing. So yeah, we thank Roger. Thank you. He, he really, really helped us out. Yeah, just looking back, you know, uh, go do a tour, take five years off, do a tour, take five years off, do a tour, take five years off. But to have had the seven years before COVID hit. Yes. And and now it's actually, although it's very, I, I made a point to someone, I've noticed my, when I've looked at entrepreneurs going through COVID, there's two types. There's the ones that were ahead of the game that have pivoted amazingly. There's the ones that were behind the curve that are trying to play catch up and you're not going to play catch up. You almost have to look ahead of where you want to be. You almost got to say, okay, I can't catch up because I was already behind, but I can look six months out and say, where do I want to right. be when we get there? And you guys were definitely ahead of the curve. And so you've got to use this as opportunity to, to rest and spend time right. with your son and to Absolutely, find yeah. these songwriting opportunities. And yeah. No, it, it's amazing. I think, um, you know, it's the plan A, B, C, D thing. And we've always done that. You know, it's um, when the record company ended. Actually, I remember, you know, Howard Kaufman, who was our manager, said, you know, CD sales, um, this was years ago. He said, a diminishing, like, and actually all, all bought music is 8% each year. They had 8%, 8% <laughs> until it's going to be uh, done. And then you had the, you know, buy stuff, download it and, and stuff, and then that's going to disappear and it's going to be streaming only. And it's like the movie industry had a, had a similar thing as well. And they don't even have a theatre thing because that was on the decrease anyway, at least in music. You know, if you had success and, and you had a bunch of hits, you could actually go out on tour. 
which is again what Howard Kaufman was he said look that's what we're gonna hit hard that there's a great thing and, and you know when we finally got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame it made a huge difference I really feel bad for like the, the guys this year that, that got in because they, yeah. they had no um, COVID just kind of killed it all really so I don't even know how, how that's going to come back so we'll, we'll see like we have to trust our fingers but I, I do think um, you can be positive you, you make positive out of every kind of bad situation when something closes something else opens up as that's we all so know true. yeah that's and so I think that that's that's what happened here it's like what are you going to do I'm, I'm chasing Jackson around which is awesome writing you know recording it's just non-stop I, I'm really busy and, and also physically just keeping that thing up so that when we do get the thing, I can just go ding and yeah, shirt off and away we go. There's some things that will never be the same. Right. Like I'm in the seminar business and, you know, hotels, working with hotels, it's going to be really difficult. And uh, seminar promoters, it's, it, or excuse me, concert promoters to put on a big, event you know what that takes yes knowing that the governor of a state or the mayor of a city can shut it down the night before yeah that type of liability it's it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out definitely yeah definitely there, there's some well, places that will have music and there's some that won't some right people um, are just aren't going to go to certain yeah areas that there's that kind of vulnerability that in 24 hours a whole thing could get shut down because of one person it seems to be in the US. I mean, again, I was speaking to a friend in, in New Zealand and they were, they had a 40,000 seat stadium rugby game because they'd got the thing so low yeah. that even when, they, when two cases did pop up, that was someone coming from England that they'd allowed to see their dying uh, parents, they contact traced it uh, and it actually worked. I know, I know New Zealand's an island <laughs> and I know it's easier and, and uh, but they're doing it, they're having success in certain places in, 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 in Europe as well, in Scandinavia. Like I know Sweden done contact, uh, so they, they did herd immunity, which actually didn't work. But they approached it in the right way. They, they said everyone's got Wi-Fi, so people who are sick or uh, underlying conditions or older people, you stay in, do everything remotely. So that worked great, and they let the young people out. It turned out it didn't work out for them. They were still catching it at a really high rate and then they had to lock it down as opposed to Norway, which actually borders it and, and kind of Denmark. They had a lot more success and they, they clamped it down. So I think that it looks like anyone who's, who's actually had any success to, and going back to normal C has to clamp it down for four weeks. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, that, that's, that seems to be the, the case so far. So we, we'll see. We'll see. It, it, it's... Uh... It's again, they asked Jim Rohn, what's the future going to look like? And yeah. he said, the future's opportunity mixed with difficulty. And he's like, that's the way it's always going to be. <laughs> right? Opportunity yeah. mixed with difficulty. And sometimes, that. you know, our difficulties, we seem like couldn't get worse. Well, you and I didn't go through a World War I or a World War II or stuff that's always been around. Yes. You know, it's yeah. just, this is new for us. But it's interesting because I remember talking to my mom about that and she never really spoke about it. And I said, well, you know, I said, well, you, you was there when, when, when the Nazis were blowing the place. Up. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was great. I said, what do you mean? It's great. She said, well, everyone stuck together. Everyone pulled mm. for each other. And we had to go down to the air raid shelter. They had to go around to the, to the Metro and underground and, and air raid shelters because they were blowing this stuff up. And if you, St. Paul's cathedral was on fire. I mean, you, yeah. I, I grew up in England and London and, and the, the idea of that, that being on fire and blowing up and, and people trying to kill everyone was so, you know, weird to me, so alien. And they said, oh yeah, that's what happened. And we, we, we got through it. And I was like, wow, that, that's some real strength. And we, we forgot that, you know, the further yeah. we're away from a, a, a terrible, awful calamity, we can't really understand it. So this is interesting because I, I think everyone's having their, their calamity moment. They're having this kind of terrible thing and that, that whether we'll um, succeed or not is another thing, so socially, I mean, you know. Right, and again, uh, you've traveled the world. So you've been to luxury, you've been to poverty. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is 
the, the more someone is witnessed, the more appreciation they have. Sometimes Definitely. for us in America, if the electricity goes out, we're, you know, freaking out because that impacts everything. It's a hundred degrees outside, Absolutely. you know, the free, and we forget there's people, you know, in parts of the country. I have a friend that went to Cuba and they said, Hey, I'm going to be on the streets for 30 days and just live with the people. Yeah. And said in 30, and this is last year. They said in 30 days, not one day could they get eggs with bacon or get bread or cereal with milk. Every day it was just like you could buy one staple at the local little store, but just even having the food you'd want to eat didn't exist. On, right. And, and so we take so much for granted. But you've That's traveled the world, right? You've seen every culture, every religion. And yes. uh, that gives perspective, right? Total perspective. And, and it's, the journey is fascinating. And I think, you know, being part of, you could ignore it as well, because people can, can luxury travel and they, they don't see those right. things. I, I absolutely see those things and, and they're really important. You know, we, um, we, were on, we were doing a TV thing in India, Def Leppard, this is years ago. And uh, we went to, we was invited to someone's house and, and they, the, the cutlery was, was 24 karat gold. Everything was, you know, and, and the chef, they flew stuff in from Kashmir that morning, mushrooms, and it was that exquisite and it was amazing. Then we went outside and there was poverty that you couldn't, you, there was slum dog millionaire, but, but, but yeah. way worse than that. Like, mm -hmm. there, there, was, there was people with their, they cut their fingers off so that when you, they beg, it makes you feel sorry for them, which you do. You're like, oh my God, that's terrible. When you see someone who's 80 years old and they've been begging since they had their fingers cut off as a child, it, it puts that into a weird perspective as well. And especially as we just had this dinner you, and then you come out literally and this is on the streets and you're like, wow, this is it's fascinating. And then again, our people um, cope with it or appreciate it. Like I met some of the coolest people in the world and, and in India and they were just like really poor but happy you know so it, it's it it's a, it's a learning curve and it's like you know you just got to take it all in and kind of add it to your data you know you you kind of like you, every day you go okay that's a learning curve and I, I from this I got I garnered this and actually make it part of your arsenal you seem to have that kind of perspective too. We've talked and you really are about getting better and learning yeah. and growing and looking at this lifetime as an opportunity to learn the lessons you need to learn. Yeah. Uh, is that again, just something that's evolved for you over time to have that type of philosophy? It absolutely has. I mean, I think I was, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was asthmatic and, I actually think I learned that, you know, it's a nervy complaint off of my mum. She was very, she had asthma. She was very nervy about, oh, this is going to happen, which is amazing when she'd tell me these World War II stories. And I, I'd go, knowing this woman, and then she's going, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was cool. You know, it was a, yeah, the, well, they blow them. We all stuck together. And went, it's like, perhaps that's what kind of started it off, actually, the World War II experience. But, um, uh, yeah, you, you do, you, you take all this in. And I, I go, going back to this thing, the asthma thing, I think, when I got confidence in myself, uh, again, I was like, oh, wow, it, you, the, the feeling is different. And the asthma kind of went away. Mm. And when I started playing guitar, I, I, I think um, my doctor as a kid said, I'm not going to give him an, an inhaler that they rely on. He said, I want him to go swimming. And, and you, when you're swimming, you're, you're thinking about other things. And if it is in that, yeah, obviously it scars your lungs and all that stuff. But if it, um, it, it's also learned, like I said, like I think a, a lot of kind of um, conditions are actually learned or, or made worse by the fact that, that you like, Ooh, like this. And I think with something like swimming, in my case, I was able to go, oh, this is really cool. And, and after a while, this, I kind of would forget about that I couldn't breathe and I would, it would open the lungs up and I'd be going, oh my God, I'm, I'm concentrating on the, on, on the swimming part of it. And it was fascinating. And, and I always use that story. And um, I, I think every, every little thing you learn, it, it makes co confidence, not to the point it's braggadocia, but to, to the fact that you can actually deal with stuff and, and you, you, you don't feel embarrassed about things or, or you, uh, 
again, when I first become a vegetarian, I, I felt kind of bad that I would put people out. I don't really want to eat like that. And I don't want to feel Then at some point I was like, you know what? This is, I'm not going to please you because I, I choose to do something else. So it becoming an empowerment thing for me, actually not again, not to, you know, beat my chest or anything, right. but it was like, I believe in this because of this and that by saying that empowered me. And again, it wasn't a, a, a big edit or a, a, a ego thing. It was a confidence thing. There is a difference. And, I, and, and it, it, was, it was very interesting. So I have little things like that happen to me all the time. And they, they do take you to, the, to another level. I, I interviewed uh, Darren Hardy. And we talked about his, uh, his extreme focus on doing stuff really at a high level. And he said, listen, Kyle, and it served him really well. And he said, yeah. that, listen, Kyle, like, it was birthed out of a weakness. He said, my weakness was I didn't feel I was good enough. My mom left when I was a kid. He kind of went through the whole story. And he says, kind of like Steve Jobs, I was trying to prove I'm worthy. He said, but I'm okay with it now because it served me well. And he yes. said, I really believe all of us, it's our weaknesses, it's our challenges that actually help us you know, when we do the opposite, it, it helps pull out the opposite. And I hear a little bit of that of what you're saying. You took Absolutely. a challenge and you turned it into, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to learn to play the guitar. I'm going to learn to sing. I'm going to yeah. go out in front of the audience. I'm going to be bold yes. versus this maybe natural tendency to have some fear, have some worry, have some concern. The introvert to the point that it, it actually... And I always keep coming back to the physical thing. You can see something introverted people where the shoulders go over it, it. They don't breathe so much. The postures changes. So all of these things are, are kind of related. So I think there's, there's absolutely something for, for recognizing those weaknesses as, as a strength in getting you to the next, the next stage or level, if you like, you know, without putting a too fine and without being silly on it. Remember game of death, the Bruce Lee movie. Yes. Each level was, it was a harder thing. It's like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, this giant, he had to fight him in, in this thing. And, and he, you know, it was, but it actually, it's very symbolic, if you like. You know, that's life. You know, you, you, you get to the next level and it's like, ooh. And you don't even realize that there are levels, but all of a sudden someone lets you know about it and you go, okay, well, I can do, I can, I can hang here. This is cool. And, and you just have to accept yourself. And, and your limitations make your limitations your strengths or, or be, be aware of them. And then they, then it becomes your strength. You know, Phil, that kind of reminds me of here. You're this rock star. You have, you know, people are like, Oh my God, Phil, you know, getting to play in front of 80,000 people and rock and roll hall of fame and the whole thing. Uh, but I'm sure you have challenges too. And that's just the part of life, right? Absolutely. Is that everyone has, their own battles, has their own challenges. And, you know, I, I, as parents oftentimes want to say, well, I grew up with these hardships and my kids have it so good, but everyone has challenges and it's, it's yeah. all just part of the life, the human condition, if you will. I agree. I totally agree. It's, uh, it's always been there, always will be, you know? So the uh, the podcast is called Success Habits of Super Achievers. Do you have some success habits you practice, whether it's daily or weekly or on some sort of rhythm? Yeah, I think yeah, obviously the physical thing. That's that's I, I think because they're all related. Like I keep saying, it's uh, everything is. Um, I follow the muse. I let that happen. I'm I'm always uh, and again the uh, these are all connected because I, I my phone is full of song ideas. And actually, like I said, I'm going through these old cassette tapes from the eighties at the moment. I'm just uh, going through all of this stuff and I'm, I'm finding just crazy amounts of stuff. Um, and I, I think consistency of, of whatever you do is so important because it's so easy to, to fall off that um, track, if you like. It's so easy to fall off the consistency track and then it becomes, then you have to get back into it or on it. And, and that's, that's something, um, that's a lot harder. So I think you maintain whatever you're doing and, and, and uh, regularly inspired by whatever it is. I, I think that that helps success. 
it, it kind of it, it keeps you in a um, in a good box to, to be able to, uh, um, to achieve more. So do you meditate or do you have some form of like yes. I've heard Alan Watts say that meditation could be anything. It could be writing a song, right? right? Whatever helps you lose time in thought is meditation, but I, do you have some sort of meditation practice? I, I do, but I, again, like one of, one of the hardest things to do is to meditate and, and actually think of nothing. If you focus on your eye center right there and, and kind of get everything out, it's the hardest thing in the world, especially if you've got songs running through your head and, and, <laughs> and, and, and your little boys running around, like, you know, Jackson's like just flying. So I struggle with it, but it, I, yeah, I do do it. And, and it's really great to, to kind of to, to flush it out. And, and a meditation is, is a very powerful thing because of that, you, uh, it gives you some, some time alone and to, to escape really. Yeah. So like, I know for me, if I'm sitting outside enjoying nature and the yeah. goal is to meditate, but it's also just to kind of chill and yeah, some idea comes floating by, but it's a really good idea. In your right. case, it would be a song. Yeah. I'm thinking I I'm pretty sure Paul McCartney, if the song yesterday came by, he's not going to say, Hey, let me pick this up in an hour. He's going to just. Absolutely. So, because you so, forget. Well, that's the amount of times I've dreamt something and I go, oh, I should, or just before I've gone to bed, I've got this idea and I, I should write this down or I should record it. Oh, this is so good, I'm going to remember it. Gone. Gone. So that's kind of like Ble the, the tail wagging the dog, in my opinion. Meditation's there to serve us. Yeah. It's not to serve it. Right. And if your son comes in, maybe that's the higher values to spend time yes. with your son, right? I totally and agree. Turn it all into a meditation, if, as Alan Watts would say. Yeah, yeah. Very powerful. I, so. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, love that. So, so Phil, again, just talking about challenges, uh, how do you approach when a challenge comes? I, I know for me at one time in my life, I, I had sold my companies and I was very much in a protective mode. So everything was in protection instead of creation. Right. So I looked at every challenge as I got to fix it or things aren't going to be okay. Well, again, when you're on a hundred city tour and you got all these moving pieces, you can't be worrying about fixing everything, right? right. You have to, there has to be a flow that happens. Yes. But how do you approach challenges? How much are you in a fix mode, flow mode? Uh, awareness like, mode. Well, I like the flow mode because you don't have to fix things. Mm. It, 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 it's what it is. You're, you're on a trajectory. Uh, when you're not in that mode, you can overthink things. You can go, oh my God, I, I haven't got any money coming in. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. My songwriting's dried up or, or whatever it is. You know, you, you, you overthink. So I, I think it's really good to keep all the moving parts going, even if you stop. So like, you know, just, just, just going on the trajectory thing. It's like, yeah, you're, you're doing this, but that mode, that success, that, that mode that, that you're in, that, that kind of, well, I'm, we're playing here. I've got this down. I'm going to get up here. I'm going to eat at this time. Uh, have, have it pretty much, it, it, it's great. And it actually runs itself, but it's not really. You're on a routine. You're on a really successful routine. And, and that, that works out great. It's when you don't do that, that you second guess yourself. And I, I think that's the problem. And I, I, I try not to do that. I, I go, well, this is, this is all good. And I really believe it is. You know, I, I think that we are going to be at, back out on tour at some point and somewhere. I, I don't know where it is. We've got our tour booked for next summer here. Uh, you know, fingers crossed if, if everyone kind of gets that together. But it's, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's cool. I, I'm pretty positive about things in general. You are. So final question what is a couple of the biggest challenges of, of uh, being famous, right? And I know famous is a relative term, but yeah. you know, there are people that would gladly stalk Phil Collin, right? That, you know, they're huge Def Leppard fans and you, you know, I, what I have found, um, you know, in, in my world with Jim Rohn and different people is the average person doesn't have a true appreciation for the demand on your time, energy, and everything else, right? And so it's hard to be artful, and it's hard to meet people's expectations. 
What it is and it's not, I mean, what you said, it is relative. Like I, the, the fame thing, I don't consider us famous because it's like, yeah, you can get in the rock and roll of fame. We, we, we're not, we can walk down the street and it's always been, always been the way. What's interesting, Mick Jagger, who's ultimately famous, a lot of the time now, they, no one would know who he is. Yeah. Whereas if Drake walks down the street or Billie Eilish, they go, oh my God, this is, this is a thing. So it is relative. And it, I don't think you should take it too seriously. We never do. And like I said, we, we're not like in everyone's face, like, you know, like some actors, they're, they're, they're there, you know, you, you, you can't miss them. It's like, right. well, we know this guy is. So I, I think that's really a, a very healthy way to look at it, that you ignore it. It's not, a, it's not an issue. And I think that the minute you kind of succumb to, to that kind of pressure, it's like, oh, I can't do this because I'm, fa yeah, obviously there's, there's times and places, but um, we, we're not really that. So it, it's kind of, it's good to be able to not have to deal, we don't have to deal with that problem. Whereas say, yeah, like someone like, and I'm trying to even think now, someone who's uh well, and it just occurred to me, you have levels of filters too. You have management, you have yeah. agents, you have attorneys. So it's not like you're going to be on a show and then people are going to direct you, contact you directly. You right. have filters before the requests get made to you. But it's a lot different to say Beyonce. If she went out, she couldn't go out. No. That, that's, that's a different right. thing. The we all can, it's, it's never an issue, you know, it's like, and if it, someone does recognize you, if they're going to say anything, probably not. So it, the, 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 the rate of you getting kind of accosted or bothered or whatever is, is kind of really remote. Very, it, very, especially if you're in a different context as well, if you're like chasing a kid around or something, you know. And there's so many judgmental people out there. So it doesn't matter who you are. You can be... And you know, the biggest actor in the world, the biggest musician in the world, yeah. half the people aren't going to like you if you're Absolutely. famous. Yeah, so yeah. how much of that, how early did you get over that of trying to please uh, everyone? No, you, you can't please everyone. So that's their opinion. As we're finding out now, you know, with, like, politically, this is so yeah. fun. How everyone's acting and reacting. Yeah. And, and you can't apply that to yourself. You, you shouldn't do because... Yeah that people are going to be that. And it's, it's an interesting uh, concept to watch p how people react. It is. And it's like, wow, this is, and it, it, it has been made worse by um, social media over the years. You know, we knew this was going to happen when they said, you know, World Wide web, you know, the su information super highway. <laughs> it was like, uh oh, we, we, we know what's going to happen. It's like, it's going to end the music industry. It's going to end the film industry. And it's going to make people be really weird socially. And, and it absolutely, I knew that straight off the bat. You know, I, I thought, well, this is great, but there, there's, a, there's a, a caveat to it. You know, it's that, that is the problem. So I think as long as you're aware of all that, it, again, it can, it can serve you. It, 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 because it, I don't let it bother me. Wow. That, you know, one thing years ago I, I saw was things converge. It's this constant like this, right? Yeah. So at one time... Uh, you know, the web comes now, everyone can go direct. Yes. But then you find everything consolidates. Everything's going direct and consolidates. So unfortunately for you guys, it consolidated with Spotify and iTunes yeah. and things like that. But then, then talent wins out over time. And then you see these, it's so like with TV that all happened. Do you see where the future's going? Uh, in music and for those that want to be in music? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I think, I think, and you shouldn't really worry about, um, people worry too much about making vast amounts of money. And I, I think that, for the, the, again, the, for me, the reward is being, uh, to be able to express myself. That I, Seriously, it, it's such a reward. And then anything else is gravy. I love playing live. That's been kind of put on hiatus at the moment, but, um, yeah, whenever that happens again. I, so I'm not going to stop. You know, what I mean, I'm, we, we're going to work towards it. I'm, you know, like I said, I'm working out every day. I'm going to, I play every day. We, we're going to be recording, and we are recording. And it's really important that you keep that going. I think that if you wait for something to turn and turn into something else, you're going to be disappointed. I think you just have to do your thing and, and know that it's going to. I remember we had records, and it was CD cassettes. 
and it was CDs and then it was downloads and then that stopped. And then it was, it was just, you, you know, um, streaming. And then, and then a lot of people going, well, what's the point of doing, you can't earn any money. Yeah, you can. It's, it's, there's, there's other ways you can get license things. Yeah, you sponsorships. Can, yeah. yeah. Do all of these other things. <clears throat> and, and, and it always, there's always something. And I, I, I get back to the inspiration thing. You know, be inspired and then, then, then you will do inspirational things. You know, Phil, I, I'll never stop this interview if we could keep going because <laughs> questions keep coming. Let me ask you one final question. Sure. What music are you listening to these days, or is there a couple of movies that really inspire you? Um, I'm like most people. I think you know we, we have these incredible uh, TV shows that that are kind of um, they're so well done. I mean, have you seen the, the latest Perry Mason? They've got it's, I haven't, it's, but I I want to. It's on. It's, it's on the great. List. You okay. know, HBO, all of these guys, they, they do this stuff and you go, wow, and you get really swept up in it. And if you're an actor, you instead of making it two hours that you've got to kind of get this character across, they can develop these characters. Yeah, yeah the City of Angels. Yeah, that, that, that was cool. And, and again, you know, you, you get to know the character. The actor gets to play the character. more. They understand. They learn more about their own character. And it becomes like a real thing so all of this stuff is fascinating i find so yeah it's, it's mainly the, the the stuff on 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 tv the tv shows are, are amazing these days so uh, again something's really happening very creative and very positive in, in a way that gets this stuff out there so it's still working and then music wise um i i'm such a big fan of the stuff that inspired everyone. You know, I, I do these little playlists every day and it's interesting to, to what I think is, is fascinating. It's usually the same thing. It's like the seventies funk or, or, you know, the, the classic, you know, Zeppelin stuff, your queen. It's like, wow, this, this stuff's incredible. And that it, it changed in the eighties. It became less about the artistry and, and more of a business agenda for not necessarily for the artists, but for the, for the industry. Yeah. And, um, you notice a difference, you notice when it changes. And now this part of that, was that part of that MTV coming out? Maybe I think MTV when it ended, because uh, again, MTV was the first reality TV, they had road rules or house rules or whatever it was. That was the first reality TV show. And, and then it kind of, ended the music thing you know I, I think uh, again you know mtv created our big buzz you know it was it was so um such it was personally successful for for def leppard it was uh you know we got on there but it was it, it's a small window and i th again you know that's the, the thing you you got to realize that nothing everything is temporary life is fleeting you know we go through these things you know you, you talk about presidents you know you go back a few hundred years it's not that long, you know, the, the, it's not that long ago that here in California or in Texas, this didn't look like it does now. And we, we get so used to it being this way and it's going to change. It's like the, you know, the coastline eroding, you know, it's like, uh, I always thought that, you know, um, India ramming into China and making the Himalayas was, was an event that took years and, you know, millions of years or whatever. But apparently it was a pretty catastrophic <laughs> And, and so you go, wow, when you, when you put that into a perspective, you, you go, wow, there's something like that could happen immediately now, you know, with us lot in there. And it's like, that would change things. That'd shake it up a bit. And, you know, we, we complaining about, well, we haven't got this. We can't do this. Yeah. Something yeah. like that or a comet, comet out of space. It'd be like, uh, yeah, asteroid. <laughs> yeah, it so, change things a lot. Big well, time. well, Phil, this has been amazing. If people want to learn more about you on social media. If they want, oh, by the way, we didn't really get to talk about Helen, your amazing wife. Helen's a phenomenal photographer, costume designer. Uh, you guys have had me in your house many times. She's amazing. Oh, so if you. people want to follow you, follow Helen, what's the best ways? Uh, for me, it's the, the Def Leppard, uh, dot com thing. It's like, you know, I, I've been, I have an Instagram thing. It's interesting. As soon as we're not on tour, I don't really go on my Instagram. Because it's it's really just a diary, you know. We'd be in Brazil; it'd be like yeah. a, a big Christ statue. I'd be up there, and then you know, you'd be in somewhere else, and that, you know, 
Sydney Opera House and stuff like that. So it's, it's more like a, a, a photo diary for me. But DefLeppard.com is, is the way. To, and to and I'll put your links to Instagram for you and Helen okay. on there too. And Delta Deep. Uh, which is, I love getting uh, those, those pretty frequent updates from you guys. So it, it's amazing. I'll, I'll keep you posted on that because we are going to be doing some new stuff soon. So yeah. And if people want to get your book, just go to Amazon. Is that yeah, the best place? Yeah, okay. I'll absolutely. put the link on how they can get your book. And again, it's just been amazing, my friend. You've been so generous. Thank you for taking the time. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.